time. I'm going to open in prayer. We're going to take some time. I want to look at a couple things here this morning. Uh, Father, Lord, be with us. Help us to understand your word. Give us clarity of mind and of thought. Give us a willingness to change our heart. Uh, Lord, we do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to look at uh, actually five things that we see here um, that, uh, that David speaks about that bring satisfaction. Uh, five, five little things, okay? And, um, and they're, they're, they're almost imperatives. They're almost things where he cries out to the Lord in his prayer and says, Lord, I, I want you to do this for me. Why? Because he's talking about being the apple of, God, the, uh, the, the, the apple of God's eye. And if you notice that, uh, we, we read about that there in, um, in, verse, uh, in verse 7, if I'm not mistaken, um, in, uh, in, verse, in verse 8. Uh, keep me as the apple of your eye. Notice that the, the, the idea of being that closeness to God and knowing him a little bit better. And I pray that that is your uh, desire to be more like Christ. And this is what, what David is, is seeking to do. And so he says, he says five things. In verses 1 and 2 he says, uh, and, and I'm reading from the New King James, a little different um, in, in, the, in, in the wording, but it means the same thing. Uh, the New King James says, hear a just cause, O oh Lord. What David is saying is, he's saying, hear me, Lord. Incline your ear to me. Know me a little bit better. Hear my cry. Hear, hear what I'm saying, Lord. Um, th this idea of God hearing us. This idea of being able uh, to, uh, uh, to, to be heard. You know, we always say, God will never leave us nor forsake us. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 talk, says, God will never leave us nor forsake us. So why would David say, wait a minute, God, you're there. Why won't you hear me? Why, why, why does God not hear us? In, uh, in Psalm 66 and verse 18, we read these words. It says this. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. See, I really think that as, as believers, as people, when we harbor sin in our heart, when we live that sinful life. Now, now, I understand, don't get me wrong, I understand we're all sinners. Okay, we're saved by grace. I understand that as well. But every day we sin. And it's not that we're trying to sin, but sometimes we sin just because there's that sin that so easily besets us. Um, you know, we, we, there, there's, there's reasons, you know, and, but, but, you know, there's some people, there's some people who have a tendency of just living in sin. They like living in sin. I'm going to do it my way, Lord. I don't care about what you want. I'm going to, uh, you know, we, we live a lifestyle or we, or we do certain things that we know deep down is really not what God wants us to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. And, and that, that's harboring sin in our heart. And you know something? When we harbor sin in our heart, the Word of God says He's not going to hear us. The only prayer that God will hear us in that situation is when we cry out to God and ask God for, for His forgiveness. In 1 John 1, 9, it says this. It says, if I confess, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. God will hear those prayers. Listen, 1 John 1, 9 was not written um, to, the, uh, to the unbelievers. It was written to us as Christians. And so we need to understand that we as, as people are going to sin. Now, you know, it, we're not maybe in a habitual, uh, you know, sinning every day or sinning all the time. <clears throat> but the word of God says, when I, when I regard iniquity in my heart, when I keep sin in my heart and I haven't confessed it, that was David's problem with Bathsheba. He had sinned and he said, no, I'm going to hide it and I'm gonna, not going to confess it. It wasn't until Nathan came, pointed his finger at him and said, that's you who have sinned. That's you who have done wrong. David then went and he, he cried out in Psalm 51 with that, that prayer of confession, Lord, know me, cleanse me. Um, you know, with hyssop, I've sinned against you. He confesses that. God hears that. But he doesn't hear if we regard iniquity in our heart. I think that's why David wrote Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. He says this, listen to this. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, I, I want to be like you. I, 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 want, I, I want you to hear me. And so, Lord, I'm coming to you and I'm asking that, Lord, you hear me. You hear my cry. Number one, he says, hear me, Lord. Number two, we find a second, second thing here. 
And that's in verse 5. Look what it says in verse 5. He says, uphold my steps in your path, that my foot may not slip. Uphold me. He says, not only, Lord, hear me, but he says, hold me. Hold me. And it's interesting, this passage is talking about how, you know, we, we need, in our, in our walk with God, we need to be careful lest we slip, lest we, we fall away, lest we have a tendency. You know, I've talked about that already, but, you know, we have a tendency, you and I have a tendency of sinning every day. It's not because, you know, hey, for all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. It's, we're not talking about a sinful nature. We're talking about every day we commit things that the flesh wants instead of the spirit wants. And the word of God, David, David is crying out and he's saying, Lord, I'm prone to sin. And so hold me close to that path you want me to follow. Hold me close to you in what I do. He says, Lord, you know me. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about how, how we're prone to sin. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and he just talked about all those witnesses in chapter 11, he says, Lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, or so easily besets us, or so easily pulls us away. Listen, there's those sins that have a tendency of, you know, we need to be here with God, and has a tendency of moving us here. And then we end up being here. And then we end up being here. And I don't know when I'm going to be out of the camera view, but you understand what I'm talking about. We tend to slide. We tend, without even no, noticing it sometimes. Earlier in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews understood that. And he, uh, and, and he says this, Therefore, we must not give the more earnest heed, or sorry, therefore we must give the more earnest heed. In other words, pay strong attention Okay, to the things that you have heard, and then it says this, Let, lest you drift away. Okay, pay, pay attention to the word of God. Why? Lest you drift away. This picture of drifting away. Have you ever been in a car and that goes steering wheel? And your car, if it's not aligned properly, tends to drift. If you're not paying attention, next thing you know, you're in the, you're crossing the line. I have a car right now that has a, that, that beeps when my car, when my tires go in the line. Um, you know, on some roads I turn it off because I'm it's, it's constantly beeping at me. I, I tend to drift. Why? Because I sight see. Oh, look at that! That bad. Look at look look at over there. Isn't that really nice? And I and and instead of instead of paying attention, I allow myself to drift. Okay, we do that in our spiritual life. David says, "Listen, Lord, Lord, hold me, uphold me, so I won't drift." Why? Because I'm prone to sin. And, and Lord, I want to be walking with you. I have a desire to be walking with you. Why? Because when I walk with you, my soul is satisfied. That's the implication that's being taught here. Okay, so, uh, so we see several things. We see, first of all, it says, hear me, in verse 1 and 2. And then in verse 5, we find the, the, the idea of hold me, uphold me. And then in verse, in verse 7, show me. He talks about how... How, how the Lord, the Lord, uh, it, it, it talks about, you know, how the Lord works and, and, and so on. Incline your ear in verse 6. And then he says, show me your marvelous kindness. I, I think what David is saying here is, Lord, I'm already asking now for you to have mercy on me when I do sin. Because the reality of it is we're all sinners. And the reality of it is we're going to sin. And that, that doesn't justify our sin. But God is a, has loving kindness. And, and isn't that what it says in that text? And, and, and it's interesting in verse 6, or verse, sorry, verse 7, it says, Show me your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand. Oh, you save those who trust you. Okay, show me loving kindness. Your, and it doesn't say just loving kindness. It says your marvelous loving kindness. The term marvelous here, I looked it up. It means different unique or set apart. There's another word in scripture that talks about being unique and set apart and different. It's the word holy. And it's basically David is saying, you know, Lord, you are totally different than anybody else. You know, the, the world says God is, it, are, are the, the gods of the world are, are gods who will judge and gods who have no mercy and gods who have no love. And, and you, you cross them and they're going, to, they're going to strike you down. But Lord, you are a God 
who is a loving kindness, who have loved, has loving kindness. You're unique and different from any other God. And you know something? If it wasn't for God's loving kindness, none of us here today would be alive because God would have struck us immediately. He would have taken care of that sin. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. You know, we, we sin, there's a punishment for that sin. But David says, have kindness, loving kindness. He, uh, loving kindness, I think, include two, include two things, mercy and grace. Okay, grace means unmerited favor. It's giving us something we didn't deserve. We didn't, we, we didn't deserve his favor. We didn't deserve his salvation. We didn't deserve, what we did deserve was punishment, was our sins needed to be punished. But by his grace, we are saved. He, he, he took that price for us, and he died for us. He, he, we didn't deserve it. We didn't do anything to merit it, but he did it. That's grace. And then what is mercy? Mercy is withholding something. It's, it's not giving us what we did deserve. See, we deserve death for the wages of sin is death. We deserve death. But God says, no, in my grace, I'm going to give you something you don't deserve. That's what, that's what David is looking at here. And he says, Lord, I, I'm asking you not just to uphold me, not just to hear me, but I'm asking you, Lord, to show your loving kindness to me. Show me. Show me your grace and your mercy. Show me what you have for me. And then we find in verse, uh, verse 8, in verse 8, it says this, keep me as the apple of your eye. Help me become the apple of your eye. Help me. The apple of your eye is the pupil that's in your eye. It's that, it's that spot of reflection. When you look at a person, a lot of times you see it's that little person that you see in the pupil of somebody else's eye. And he's saying, Lord, I want to be that pupil of your eye. I want to be so close to you that you know me. I want to be the apple of your eye. Okay? That's what he's talking about here. You know, what's he talking about? He's talking about protection. Why? Because the eye is one of those, one of those um, organs that we protect. I don't know if it's an organ, but one of those things on our bodies we protect tremendously. You know, you do something with a saw, you do something, you know, I, I, I was outside cutting a tree that fell down this past winter, and uh, Pam said, make sure you wear eye goggles. You know, eye protection. I put on my reading glasses, can't see anything, so now I'm using a chainsaw without being able to see anything. That's real good. Um, but, you know, it's protection. I know that I didn't always use protection. I have a hole in my eye. The, 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 uh, the, the eye doctor told me he has to look at my eye on every six months because he's concerned. I have a hole in my eye that he's concerned that it will continue to grow and I can lose vision as a result of it. But uh, he said something had gotten into my eye and caused a hole in my eye. Uh, you know, the eye is something we protect. And this is the picture that David is talking about here. Lord, protect me. Protect me from sin. Protect me from my enemies. Protect me from those around me. You know, an example of this is Job. In Job chapter 1, in, uh, in verse 10, uh, there's a scene of heaven. And, uh, and Satan comes and, and is before the Lord. And, and God says to Satan, hey, where have you been? He says, I've been down on earth. He says, oh, did you, did you see my servant, uh, Job? He's a, he's a righteous man. And uh, Satan says, only because you've protected him. And, and he uses this verse. He says, you have not, or sorry, you have, um, you have made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all uh, he had. Is what, is what Satan says. Listen, you have protected him. You have placed him, that, that protection around him. I think this is what David is, is, is praying about. Lord, put this protection around me that I may be able to walk uprightly and I may be able to walk with you and find satisfaction. Um, why? Because the enemy is constantly, constantly attacking. And then finally, we find that one, last, uh, one last thing that's found in verse 13. He says, Arise, O Lord, confront um, arise, O Lord, confront him, cast down him. And then it says, deliver my life from the wicked with the sword. Deliver me. Uh, deliver me is a little bit stronger than just protection. Has the idea of rescue. Why? Because the enemy is already upon me. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this psalm was probably written when, uh, when Saul uh, was uh, going after David and he had surrounded the army. Uh, the, 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 the Israel army, uh, Saul's army had surrounded David. And he was he was in, in um, wasn't sure what to do. And 
Uh, and as you read scripture, you find that the Philistines invade Israel and Saul had to remove, remove his armies and God protected David. But David says, listen, our enemy is all around us. And how true that is for you and I as believers today, our enemy is all around us. Yeah. And we need to be delivered. We need to be rescued. The word delivered here has the idea of being rescued. And, and, and isn't it nice that when we trust the Lord and, and all through this, David talks about trusting him and putting his faith in him. And when we trust the Lord, isn't it nice to know that we don't have to fear, we don't have to worry. Why? Because God's going to rescue us. God's going to take care of us. We just have to trust him. See, this is, this is what David is doing. Um, you know, he, he knew that God would do it. Why? Because God had already done it. And he tells us in Romans, he tells us this. In Romans chapter 8, he says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Listen, if God's for us, nobody, not even Satan, can stand against us. That's called rescuing. That's called God protecting and rescuing us. In verse 33 of that text in Romans 8, he says, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? And the answer is nobody. Why? Because God is protecting us. God is is, uh, is rescuing us. In verse 34, it says, who, who, uh, who is he who, who condemns? Only Christ. Why? Because he paid for us. And then in verse 35, it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he goes on. It says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril uh, or sword? And then in verse 37, it says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. See, David was concerned about being satisfied. After he prays to God, he says this, and we go back, we get back to verse 15. He says, as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Let me ask you this question. How is your likeness to Christ today? Are you, are you seeking, are you walking with the Lord, trying to be more like him? I can tell you one thing, that all all the things of this world can pass away. But there's one thing that nobody can take away from us, and that's our relationship with God. That's where satisfaction comes. David understood that. David said, he says, listen, when I awake with you, when I awake in your image, when I awake in your likeness, you know, the word of God tells us we need to be like Christ now. Are you like Christ? Are you walking in his likeness? When we walk in the likeness of Christ, what that does is it increases our level of peace, joy, and satisfaction. It helps us be satisfied in Christ. But again, we have to be in Christ. Are you in Christ? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? If you say yes to that, praise the Lord. If you say no, then the word of God says, call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Call on him, ask him to save you. Help, ask, re recognize that you're a sinner, okay? Believe that Jesus Christ died and confess your sin. That's what the Word of God tells us. Confess that He is Lord, that He is your Lord. But if you already have accepted the Lord, are you walking close to Him? Some of you will say, yes, well, praise the Lord. You know, take some time today and just worship the Lord for who He is and what He has done for you. But if you're not in the likeness of Christ, if you have these areas, and most of us do, if we like it or not, have these areas that are secret closet sins, will you confess them today? Because he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's, that's written to you and to me. Saying, hey, I need to be more like Christ. I need a relationship with you. How's your relationship? Are you satisfied today? Let's pray. Father, Lord, we do thank you for your satisfaction. We thank you that our satisfaction doesn't come from things, doesn't come from money, doesn't come from friends, doesn't come from, um, that Lord, we, we, we read a lot of different things, so reading a book. But Lord, it comes from knowing you. It comes from knowing you better every day. It comes from growing in you. And Lord, I pray for our listeners. I pray for, uh, <coughs> for our viewers today, that today they would seek your face in all things. And Lord, if there be a sin, that they would confess that. If they haven't been saved, that Lord, they would get saved today. But Lord, it's about knowing you better. I do thank you that Lord, even in the midst of the coronavirus, we can be satisfied. We can have a peace and a, and a joy knowing that Lord, my God is in control. 
And so, Lord, help us to know you better today. We do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I hope the Lord bless your heart. Have a blessed day.